Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming. I'm Nina Sadowski, Program Director of NYULA, and with me is Sharon Pierre-Louis, our ASL interpreter. You can pin her video if you would like to watch uh, her throughout. I, I'm so delighted to be here today for what I hope is the first of many collaborations between NYU Los Angeles and the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. Um, the subject matter of today's program couldn't be any more timely, and it's, uh, our speakers couldn't be any more impressive. Um, I want to thank everyone at the NYULA, NYULA team and at the Institute for their hard work in putting this together, particularly Jasmine Barad and Gracie Karapi. Um, and now let's get ready to have some knowledge dropped. And with no, uh, not another further word from me, I'd like to turn it on to, over to Madeline Denono, um, who is the CEO of the Gender, uh, Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media. Thank you so much for collaborating with us on this, uh, Madeline, and over to you. Thank you, Nina. Hi, everybody. I hope you're all staying healthy, um, you know, and safe. And so our topic today is media representation, allyship, and social justice. And allyship is an action. And to quote Ava DuVernay, she said, what I found is to have people sign petitions or everyone go to this protest, everyone may not be interested in taking action in that way. There's no one way to take action and there's no one way to be an ally. And so our illustrious panel of experts will uh, lean in, dive in, and uh, give you their point of view on that. Uh, so I just want to make sure that you all have your Zoom view set to gallery. Uh, you can also pin uh, Sharon Pierre-Louis, uh, our ASL interpreter. And just so you know that uh, we will be opening up for Q&A uh, later in the, in the event. So if you have questions, if you can just post them in the Q&A and Lisa Emery, who leads the Institute's uh, social media, will be you know, pulling out, culling your, your questions. So without further ado, I would love to introduce um, our esteemed leader, uh, Gina Davis, Academy Award-winning actor, founder, and chair of the Institute. Take it away, Gina. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm very honored and grateful uh, to uh, NYU of LA for inviting us here today to speak with all of you about social justice, allyship, and the significant role of media representation. I founded my institute to investigate gender balance on screen. And what we discovered was that male characters are seen far more and speak far more than female characters. When I first brought this data to content creators, they were shocked. They didn't realize they were putting out such a strong message that white men are far more important than everyone else. And this is why I love data. Metrics are the best way to measure what can and cannot be seen. And uh, they show us how quickly and easily how changes can be made. And we know that improving entertainment media is a crucial factor in changing the world and a key component to conquering unconscious bias that's within all of us. Uh, like we say at the Institute, if they can see it, they can be it. And now we look to all of you, and as we look to you, the next generation, we are hopeful and proud of what's to come. Your resiliency and dedication to justice and equality are something to be very proud of. In a few minutes, you're going to hear from several of our researchers and colleagues who have dedicated their lives and careers to advancing equality and diversity, both within the entertainment industry and beyond. Again, thank you all so much for being with us here today. Back to you, Madeline. Thank you, Gina. So just to like jump right in, um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Nicole Haggard, or we call her, hey, Dr. Nicole, uh, who is our esteemed colleague who wears many, many hats for the Institute, one is as uh, director of communication. Um, she is also uh, an esteemed researcher. She's um, had 16 years of study contextualizing the intersection of race and gender. Um, she teaches in the film and media and social justice program at Mount St. Mary's University, who is our esteemed partner and fiscal sponsor who we love. She's also a co-founder of CIMI, the Center for Intersectional Media and Entertainment. So, Dr. Nicole, take it away. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Madeline, and thank you, NYU. It's so great to be here and to collaborate in this way. Um, so I'm first up. What I'm going to do, since we are here to talk about, you know, how does Hollywood intersect with social justice and, and what are we all doing about it? I'm going to give us a little bit of a history lesson, my favorite thing as a professor to do. Um, if I can figure out how to make it go full screen. Here we go. Uh, a little bit of a history lesson of Hollywood's hidden history of race and gender codes. Um, this was research that I did for my dissertation um, and specifically uncovered this history. Um, and so I hope you enjoy hearing about it. We don't often hear about this history. So this is what we do hear about, right? That Hollywood has this really big inequity issue when it comes to the intersection of race and gender, both on screen and in the workforce, right? And so what I wanna talk about is how did we get here and where do we go from here? Okay, and the, the other speakers today will focus more on the how do we go, where do we go from here, but I'm really gonna focus on how did we get here. So first I wanna reframe the problem for us, okay? Um, is Hollywood is a business, right? And so at its core, we keep saying that the stories we tell are the stories that will sell, right? It's a business at the end of the day. So that means that the stories that are sold are the ones that continue to be repeatedly told. But what we don't realize is that we censored what could be told in the first place, right? So the stories that sell are stories that tell, but, but what are we actually allowed to tell? Um, and so we didn't actually censor um, like profanity or things like that. That's not what I'm talking about. We actually censored how race and other identities could appear on screen. Um, and we've all inherited this issue. So how did we get here? Let's start with The Birth of a Nation, right? Which was uh, the very first feature film in Hollywood. And um, we hear a lot about Birth of a Nation, but we don't really talk about the legacy of Birth of a Nation as being the film that sort of sparked this long history of censorship going on in the industry. So what happened when Birth of the Nation came out is that there were huge protests against the film. Um, theaters refused to show it, and so censorship came out of this. And it actually went all the way to the Supreme Court um, in a case known as Mutual v. Ohio. So the production company that put out Birth of a Nation sued the state of Ohio for not showing the film. And what happened was that the justices ruled that the motion pictures are actually a business, not an art. So they are not liable to the First Amendment freedoms of free speech um, and that they can be censored. So Justice Joseph McKenna said because of their attractiveness and manner of exhibition, that movies are capable of evil um, and that the motion picture industry is a business, not an art. So what does this mean? Um, this landmark decision and put to rest all these debates that were going on at the time of what's going on with movies and the cultural validity of censoring them. Um, and what came about from this and this sort of like disbursement of historical stuff is we have the production code, which we'll talk about today. There were dis distribution bans. There was specific race-based censorship that went down because if, when the when Birth of a Nation came out and people were having protests against it, they were like, oh, if you have showed this kind of movie, we're going to have this kind of protest. And it's a specifically race-based uprising, hint, hint, today, today. Um, and we don't want to do that, right? And so they put in all of these ordinances to make it that you couldn't show race-based pictures because they were going to cause protests. Um, and then... Moving even further, we have the rating system. So all of these things are definitely connected, but today we're gonna to focus a lot on the production code. Um, so the production code was the industry's response to, um, to these threats of censorship. So what would happen is I'd make a movie and I'd put it out and every single censorship board would, tell, would write back and say, oh, we're not gonna show your movie unless you take this out and this out. So really, it became really expensive to have to make a new movie and slice together a new movie for each um, different state or different uh, municipality. And then once the talking pictures come into place, right, this becomes even harder because you're not just like splicing scenes together. Now you're actually splicing dialogue together um, and it gets worse and worse for the industry as a business, right? So ultimately, they created the production code, which was the rules of what could and could not be in the movies as a means to forestall censorship. Um, and really it started out as this like PR stunt, really, right? It was like, we promise to make the best kind of movie uh, for the American people. And it was this like very overt language, um, but it wasn't really enforced that much. And so you might be curious of like what made it in and why. Um, and it really came down to this loud minority, okay? Um, so they pulled all of the different sort of like groups, like uh, social groups that were interested. So like women's leagues, uh, the, 
the Legion of Decency, which was a Catholic organization that would, um, the priests would say what movies you could and could not go to. Um, and so they pulled all of these organizations that were really loud about the movies and they didn't agree on less than 10% um, of the issues. So there really was no consensus. So what came, what ended up being included in the production code um, is really significant because it's not representing a majority of feelings in America, right? It really is us like placating to this loud minority. And so what ended up being included, a lot of stuff around crime and sex, as you can imagine, were the main thematic concerns. Um, but when it comes to the intersection of race and gender, the thing that we're really concerned about is the miscegenation clause. And the miscegenation clause said that sex relationships between the white and black races are forbidden. And you might think that this just applies to like interracial relationships, um, but really they use the miscegenation clause to talk about bodies on screen. Right, so it was like race, it was a race-based censorship um, that they would say, oh, that violates the miscegenation clause. Um, so for example, the Lamel Studios attempted to make the film Stevedore in 1936, and they received this response from the Production Code Administration. This story, I'm reading this, sorry. This story seems to be to us exceedingly dangerous. Note they use the word dangerous from the standpoint of the Production Code because it deals with such an inflammatory subject portraying as it does the unfair treatment of the blacks by the whites and touching upon the subject of an alleged attack by a black man on a white woman, an attempted leeching of a Negro, et cetera. It suggests to us the kind of story which if made into a picture, we would have to reject, right? So what would happen is you would submit your script to the production code administration um, and all studios were required to submit their scripts. You would get a $25,000 fine if you released a movie without the production code administration seal of approval um, and movies without it would be barred from theaters so this is phase two right at first it was just this pr stunt and then we had a change of leadership and then it becomes this thing that's really instilled into how the business of the industry works um, and so i really want you to pay attention to the idea that they thought that anything dealing with race was dangerous right and whose point of view is this that it's dangerous so where are these loud minorities coming in so um the movie theaters themselves uh, would also write to the production code administration and let them know what they wanted to see on screen. And so the loudest opponents to this kind of stuff were Southern patrons, right, as you can imagine, and Southern distributors and theater owners. Um, and so again, the production code was playing nice. These are the people that they chose to play nice with, right? And I want you to note the at the very end of this, they're asking the Hayes organization, that's another word for the production code administration, to refrain from using Negroes in scenes with whites, except in a servile capacity or where they are per se. So it's literally saying, we only wanna see um, African-Americans in film if they are in a servile capacity to white folks. This is going beyond just bodies on screen, but really coming into social relationships, right? They had these, huge control over social relationships and the control of images that came on screen. They manufactured the social invisibility of interracial social relations and friendships and marriages um, and families. So they were erased from the screen because they're placating to these uh, voices. And this is a specific decision that they're making. Um, I love this quote from Bell Hooks because she constantly reminds us that control over images essential to the maintenance of any system of domination, of racial domination. And the production code is literally rules that are telling us how we can show images and what images we can show and what we cannot. Um, and so it's really important that we ground our understanding of this period in this place, right? Because it's not just um, these random choices, right? That are an obvious result of cultural taboo. These weren't like majority feelings in America. These are very purposeful strategic responses to a few dissenting voices. And this is what we get. And this is the history of cinema that then um, comes out of this period. So moving forward then, um, so now we're all the way into 1952. So the production code has been going on for 30 years with all of this race-based censorship happening. Um, and it's easy to forget that not everyone was in agreement with this, right? Like we think of this as being like a cultural era where things were really bad. No, there were plenty of voices. There are even voices within the production code administration that were saying, hey, this is wrong. People don't just want those kind of movies. And they sent reports. One man's name was Francis Harmon. And he would send in pages and pages of reports to let the production code administration know that people were demanding interracial pictures, that they wanted to see something different. Um, and he highlighted that this was a sectional bias, right? It wasn't a universal feeling, but because it's put into the movies, 
then we feel like it's this universal feeling. Um, so I think it's really important for us to really uh, note those dissenting voices that are coming through in these eras, right? So I mentioned before those race-based ordinances. Um, so by the time 1952 rolls around, obviously we're you know, in the full thrusts of the civil rights movement at this point. Um, things are really getting going. And Hollywood still has these rules against race and gender. And a lot of cities have these, um, these, these rules about the racial unrest that will come about if they show race-based pictures in their city. But people are smart to it now, right? They're like, no, that's some BS. This is like a clouded, obvious tool um, as an overtly racist attempt to suppress the visibility of blackness on screen, right? And so they're getting mad about it and it's no longer received passively. Um, and so the film Pinky comes out and the state of, uh, the city of Gelling in the state of Texas um, attempts to censor the movie and not let it be shown based on one of these ordinances and the production company Gelling sues them and it goes all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decides that racial representation is no longer um, a constitutional grounds for censorship, right? So they declare that it is literally unconstitutional to use race-based censorship as um, a form of uh, censorship for the studios. So now we no longer have race as an issue, right? The other thing that happens around this time is we have something called the Miracle Decision, which reverses that original um, Ohio v. Mutual decision. And so now it is now said that the motion picture industry is an art. It's not a business. So because it's an art, they now are like have all of the, the freedom of speech behind them. So race is no longer an issue. Uh, the threat of censorship isn't an issue because now you have First Amendment protection. So what do you think the industry did? Sadly, they doubled down. They went even harder um, on this stuff. And unfortunately, they recommitted themselves to this mission. Um, and by the time the 1960s roll around, they start talking about how embarrassing it is that they made that choice. Um, but it's already too late, right? We've had like almost 40 years of this race-based censorship happening in the industry. Um, and so ultimately, they abandoned the production code in 1967 and replaced it with the rating system. Um, so, whereas the production code talked about issues of race as being forbidden and handled with care, the rating system shifted it to shall not be justified. Um, so what we have is now it's fully visible, right? It's on screen, you're allowed to show it, but now it's symbolically forbidden through plot points and character tropes and things like that. So this sort of legacy lives on. So what is the legacy of this? Um, there's one intersection that I think is really fascinating, and that is the miscegenation clause, right? Um, and really what I studied was what bodies on screen did they really care about? And when it came down to it, they let every other race and gender combination be made except for black men and white women. Um, and even today, we think of black men and white women on screen as being um, Hollywood's greatest taboo, right? You see this quote from GQ magazine in 2005, where they're saying, um, is it Hollywood's greatest taboo? And then here we have it in 1964, where they're talking about that Hollywood's breaking the, their, their greatest taboo. The last of Hollywood's greatest taboos is being broken. So if it was already broken in 1964. Why are we still talking about it in 2005? Like, why is this such a thing for us? Um, when I was in film school at USC, I turned in a script that had a, a black man and a white woman as the, the leads. And my professor was an Academy Award winning um, screenwriter. And when I turned it back over to get my grade, it said on the top, switch it around, make it a white man and a black woman. And I went up to him and asked him why. And he said, because it wouldn't get made the other way around. And I was like, that's weird. Um, but I was an undergrad. And then I keep going in my education and I discovered the miscegenation clause, right? So from 1927 to 1956, it was completely forbidden. And I discovered that to this day, there's only been um, six films where a black Black men and I, white women will have sex on screen and stay together by the end of the movie. So that's a legacy of this. And we literally have zero studio romances where we will see this couple date, get married, have children. Um, and so the entire Hollywood system got in cahoots to sort of censor this couple. And although my professor may not have realized it, his instruction resulted from this initial ban, right? There's this long history of these assumptions about what will sell and what you can put on screen um, and it's more than just a simple reflection of early 20th century cultural norms. The decisions made by the Production Code Administration operated in the service of white supremacy and created this long-standing industry standards when it comes to the intersection of race and gender. But if we don't know, right, that this history was this history of censorship in the beginning, 
then the assumptions, like my professor saying, it just won't get made the other way around. So just switch it, right? And then we don't realize that we're continuing to participate in this long legacy. Um, so going back to the idea that the stories we tell are the stories that sell, if the same people are in charge and passing down these assumptions and the way that the industry works, we're gonna just keep telling the same stories without understanding the reason why we don't tell those stories is because they were forbidden and censored in the first place. So I want you to think about what assumptions are you telling yourself about what will sell and what will not as someone who aspires to work in the industry um, and how will you show up differently now that you know this history. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. I really appreciate that. Uh, and just so you know, if you want to follow uh, Nicole, you can see her on social media at Hey, Dr. Nicole. So now I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Ninoshka Taggart, um, who's a, a senior researcher with the Institute. She also holds a PhD in sociology from the University of California. And she's going to talk about the importance and, uh, the, and the role in the history that social movements um, have played. She's also going to talk about uh, Black Lives Matter, and she's going to present some data specifically on race and representation that really spotlights some of the Institute's trailblazing research. So take it away, Dr. Taggart. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm excited to be here. Uh, today, I'll be talking about the importance of social movements, media representation, and also social justice. All right, let me just get my slides up. All right, so let's talk first about a definition of what a social movement is. So social movements are organized efforts by a large number of people to bring about or impede social, political, economic, or cultural change. So now I think 2020 is an important year because we see a lot of social movements um, uh, being reinvigorated and also popping up. Um, historically, we know of social movements. We've seen the civil rights movement, Me Too movement, fat acceptance movement, uh, disability rights movement, gay rights movement, um, among others, but that list continues on and on. Um, but these social movements are really, really important because it brings focused attention to a social problem. So right now we see a lot of attention on racial injustice. And, um, you know, a lot of people who might not have been aware of the severity of racial injustice in this country are now, um, you know, open to hearing about it, learning more information, um, learning in their community, which is really important. So it puts pressure on government entities, corporations, and other institutions. So social movements are really important because it is actually forcing change and forcing progress. Uh, for instance, with corporations, people have been using um, their financial power to boycott certain corporations that they don't think um, are supporting the cause of racial justice. And other institutions, as I mentioned here, also are have pressure put on them. Um, so we're seeing that, you know, for instance, Hollywood is is changing as well, um, and other social institutions are also following suit. Um, so this awareness that is is being brought about on social issues. Um, also affects public policy. So we're seeing a push for uh, change in legislation. Um, culture is also changing. So when we look back at 2020, we'll see um, fashion, music, and I would include Hollywood and media also um, will reflect um, this moment in time. And then also I noted activists also um, have a change because we see that people who engage in social movements and social activism in their 20s are more likely to also engage in political activism and social activism later in life. So it really is, can be uh, a life-changing moment in uh, a social activist's life. 
So next I wanted to talk a little bit about why Black Lives Matter movement is significant. So it was co-founded by Alicia Garza, Patrice Kahn Colors, and Ulta Medi. And the group has a commitment to work vigorously for freedom and justice for all Black people and by extension, all people. So the message here is that if we find freedom and equality for Black people, it actually extends to all people and it actually um, benefits all of society for everyone to be equal. Um, so the group also demands accountability for the dehumanization and devaluation of, uh, of Black people at the hands of police and also fights to combat anti-Black racism. And one important thing I want to mention is that Black Lives Matter also acknowledges the harm of colorblind racism. So if you're not familiar with what colorblind racism is, it's the movement from more overt types of racism that we saw, let's say from the Jim Crow era, where separate and equal and segregation of, of black and white people. And now we have a model of colorblind racism. It's the idea that you're not ju being judged by the color of your skin, but you're being judged by what type of person you are, how hard you work. So the ideology here is if we don't look at race and we ignore it, then it's not really a problem. And as you can see, that is actually very problematic. If we ignore race, the, our racial problems will not go away. Um, this movement also recognizes uh, systemic and institutional racism. So it's the idea that it is um, entrenched and entangled in all of our social institutions. And it's not just a matter of individual races, it's actually at a systemic level. And then another important, point to mention is this uh, movement also talks about the lived experience of Black people. So the lived experience of Black people is now going to be in the spotlight. Um, you know, their experiences have been pushed to the side or ignored for so long that this movement really puts them out front and center. So I wanted to switch gears to how media shapes our lives. And uh, speaking to a point that Dr. Hager made is this idea of controlling images. So the idea that, you know, people often think, oh, well, how does media really influence us? How is it so powerful? It really is powerful. And these are two points I wanted to mention. Uh, controlling images, our images are designed to make racism, sexism, poverty, and other forms of social inequality appear to be normalized and natural parts of life. So these go beyond stereotypes and tropes. They're actually images that control uh, how we see things. So we're seeing uh, forms of social injustice as something that is just inevitable and normal and bound to happen. Um, and then with that, symbolic annihilation is the damage caused by the absence of or stifling of a multitude of narratives. So this is where media can really make a difference. It's the idea that if you're only showing one perspective of life in America or globally, um, that's not showing most of the true picture, right? It's not an accurate, accurate represent, representation of reality. So it's very important that we show a multitude of narratives to accurately uh, reflect the society we live in. So uh, today I'm going to focus on Black women in Hollywood and specifically some of the research we've been doing here at the Institute um, about how Black women are represented in television and film. So first I wanted to talk about why further research is needed in this realm. So we have seen more representation and um, you know, more progress made as far as representation goes in film and television uh, for black, indigenous and other people of color. However, there is still much room for improvement. Um, so the idea is we have made improvement, but yet we can go much, much further. Um, we also need to examine roles being played by women as representation is more than just presence. And I want to emphasize this because it could seem on the surface, well, you know, Black people and Black women are making strides in this realm, but we have to look and see what roles they are playing. Um, because if they're playing stereotypical roles, that representation is not necessarily uh, progressive, right? It's just continuing the cycle of the stereotypical um, representation in Hollywood. 
So we really need new standards for representation, diversity, and inclusion in media. And we have seen some progress. You've probably heard about um, the new inclusion and diversity standards for ABC. That was, I think, uh, um, just announced within the last week. And then we see for Best Picture for the Oscars, also rolling out new diversity inclusion standards, not only with who we see on screen, but also behind the scenes. So writers, directors, also people who are working in companies and the corporate side of companies. So it's really important for us to, um, you know, incorporate these standards on all levels, um, not just in front of the screen. So I wanted to just to share this quote that I found that I thought was, uh, it really struck me. So Whoopi Goldberg said that, well, when I was nine years old, Star Trek came on. I looked at it and I went screaming through the house. Come here, mom, everybody come quick, come quick. There's a black lady on television and she ain't no maid. I knew right then and there I could be anything I wanted to be. So I included this quote because I think it really speaks to what we're trying to do at the Institute. So. Um, you know, if she can see it, she can be it. In this case, the idea that Whoopi Goldberg was seeing someone that was not in a stereotypical role was kind of earth shattering for her because she knew that, um, you know, she would be able to play different roles than just maids or nannies or other stereotypical roles of black women at that time. So a little bit about our methodology, I won't go too deeply into it, but just to give you a basic idea, we have a team of researchers doing expert um, human coding. Um, we coded about 3,000 characters in the top 100 family films rated G through PG-13, and then we analyzed um, nearly 5,000 characters in the top 50 most watched children's TV shows. Um, we're also de developing the GDIQ which stands for the Gina Davis Inclusion Quotient. And this will track um, and do an automated analysis of screen time and speaking time. So we hope that this will help also um, be a tool with representation. But for um, this presentation, I'll be focusing mainly on representations of uh, Black women in film. So if we look here, we have a baseline of about 7% of the population of Black girls uh, and women. And we see um, some parity with that in film. We see 7% of film characters are Black and female. However, in our research, we found that only 3% of television characters are Black and female. So as far as black female leads go, we see that um, there is, you know, some positive news that in our study, we found that 10% of uh, leads were black and female. And uh, only, as I said, that baseline was 7% in the population at large. However, if we look at uh, other female leads of color, we see that they are 14.3% of the population, but only 1.8%. Um, on screen. And then for white women, we see overrepresentation, representation uh, 33% uh, female white leads versus 31% of white women in the population at large. So um, here are some more statistics from this study of Black women in Hollywood. So um, in our study, we see that 8.9% of Black women were shown in STEM professions, which is promising because we see white women were shown at an equal rate. However, we see that other women of color are lagging behind in this realm. And as far as being shown as smart, um, we see that actually other women of color are most likely to be shown as smart. Um, then black women comes in next and then white women comes in um, just trailing a little bit from black women. So this is also a promising um, statistic here. And then being shown as a leader, we see that uh, black women are shown as a leader about 45.6% of the time versus 47.3% for white women. And other women of color are also lagging behind in this category. So here are some troubling, I guess, uh, 
statistics that we found in our study. So we see that only 9.3% are shown as upper class for black women versus 16.5% for white women. Now this is troubling because it seems to speak to the stereotype that black women and black people on film are often shown as being of a lower socioeconomic status. So this could be um, the reason why uh, we see this and this might be a controlling image. And then being shown as violent. We also see that black women and black people are shown as violent and aggressive, um, hot, you know, hot tempered. So we see here 35.6% of black women are shown as violent versus 29.5% for white women and 25% for other women of color. And then uh, sexual objectification is also an issue that we deal with with representations of black women in Hollywood. So we see here again, black women are more likely to be sexually objectified than white women and also women of color. So again, these controlling images might still be at play where we still see these stereotypical representations of black women. So intersectional representation, I just wanted to wrap up the statistics with this chart here. So we see that we are looking intersectionally because we're looking at women and black and, and, and race and gender in one. But however, we can add other attributes and other identities to our characters. So although we see 11.5% um, of black female characters who are 50 plus, People who are ages 50 plus are 34% of the population. Uh, for LGBTQ community, we see that they are 4.5% of the population, but only 1.8%. Uh, disabilities, also people with disabilities are far underrepresented. Um, we see black female characters are not even 1% of uh, characters and uh, people with disabilities are 19% of the population. And then we see a similar trend with large body types. 40% of the population has large body types, but we're only seeing 11.8% in this group. <clears throat> I just wanted to end my portion of this talk with a quote from Viola Davis that she gave to Entertainment Weekly. She said, Toni Morrison said that as soon as a character of color is introduced in a story, imagination stops. And why I wanted to stress this point is that we really need to make strides in order for accurate representations of Black women to be shown on television. Um, I would also argue for other people of color and any other underrepresented identity that we have. It's really important to show multiple um, perspectives and also accurate present. Uh, presentations and representations in media because media does have such an impact on our lives and you know we have a long way to go as far as progress. Thank you so much uh, Dr. Taggart and another thing is you know we are talking about the social imperative but there's a business imperative and doing good is good for business and what we have found out from some of our other research is that when you have diverse characters on screen, you will have many more uh, diverse audience members and you can really drive a lot of box office. And some of our other comrades this week uh, released some data about showing how, uh, from a box office standpoint, that the more diverse of a cast, um, the more money you can make. And we have also uh, found that correlation with our own work. So to bring us all back home um, to you know our theme about um, allyship, you know, is in action. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce you to Munich Ale, who's a VP at uh, uh, Film at Miramax. She's also co-founder, along with Nicole, for CME, the Center for Intersectional Media and Entertainment, and she's really going to talk to you about what does authentic allyship mean? Uh, what does it mean in media? And, and what you can all do to be uh, an authentic ally. And then I'll come back and Lisa will jump in and we'll go to Q&A. So please uh, start uh, and listing your questions in the Q&A. Okay, take it away, Monica. Thanks, Madeline. All right, well, um, let me share my screen. Let's see. Okay, 
Um, so uh, I'm here to talk to you about allyship within the industry. And you've already heard from Nicole uh, a little bit about the history of the industry and from Dr. McTaggart, uh, some more about the social movements and stats, but how do you fit into all of this as somebody who is either in the industry or aspiring to be in the industry? And I want you to take a look at this from a very personal lens. So think about now, why you joined the entertainment industry or why you want to. Why are you compelled to be a storyteller? Because this really is an industry that is driven by passion. For me, um, it comes down to when I was a kid, I wasn't allowed to watch that much television, funnily enough. And so I always got lost in books and I learned to really love film. And to me, the most powerful stories were the ones that made it so that you could relate to characters from any background, place, time period, etc. Um, and so at its core, you know, even if the protagonist of what I was watching or reading was an alien or a mouse in a time period 50 years from now, um, to me, storytelling was about humanity and connecting people. Um, and whatever your reasoning is, that's really the power of storytelling. It's what draws us together, it gives us a narrative to believe in, it creates empathy for others, it influences our behavior. You've heard multiple times now, if she can see it, she can be it. And that's really the power of film and television. It shows us what's possible. Um, in some way, we are all drawn to the media and participants in the media landscape. And at CME, we have this, heuristic that we use called the five A's. Um, as an audience member, you are constantly participating with media by voting with your dollars and eyes to indicate what's important. And so as an audience member, you matter. Um, it matters what you're watching, what you're subscribing to, if you're paying for a cable subscription, if you're paying for movie tickets, that all matters and so does social media. Um, there are academics who you've heard from two of them today. They're using their knowledge and research to expand our worldview and basically just get things right, or at least better. Um, and activists who are pushing the boundaries of what's possible with media. But what I really wanna focus on for our conversation is these last two artists, uh, the creatives who are making the content. Um, many of you students already are these artists and a lot of you are aspiring to be artists and allies within the industry. These are people who are operating the industry. Like myself, I'm an executive at a movie studio um, and that will also be you increasingly in the future. Um, and so I wanna hone in first on allies in the industry because it's important to really understand where the industry is now um, to figure out your place in it and how you can affect change. Uh, so first off, I want to take a look at who holds power in the industry. And I grabbed some screenshots from uh, various companies to show you who holds the power currently. So these are the top executives from some of these major companies. And just take a look at their pictures, see what you can, if you can discern any patterns. I think it might be obvious that at a lot of these companies, which are shaping what you are seeing on screens, the people in powers of positions of power are overwhelmingly white and male. And this is the studio heads, and it trickles down to senior executives and the, the people who are running units, but all the way down to vice presidents. It's predominantly white and male. And I'm so sorry if you guys can hear the leaf blower outside. Um, <laughs> uh, of course, it's happening right now. Um, I'm sorry for that. Uh, but I will keep going. Um, it's really, those are the people who are the decision makers. Um, they're the ones who are deciding what to green light, what films and television shows should be broadcast through your televisions and through your phones or shown on the big screen. And at the end of the day, they're deciding who gets the money to make that content as well. And this really impacts you as future filmmakers. So 
those are the folks who are deciding if somebody, if a filmmaker gets $2 million for their project or $200 million. And I want to take a look at film directors as a microcosm uh, for this space. So when movies are greenlit, studios are often making safe bets, um, which means usually they'll give them to people who have directed successful films before. And in most cases, that's white men. Um, of the top 100 grossing films in 2019, only 12 were directed by women. And four of those were directed by women of color, plus one which was directed, co-directed uh, by a male-female duo. Um, and it's one thing to say that the percentage of female directors uh, who are directing film and television projects is increasing, um, but I think it's also important to look at the projects themselves and especially how much they cost. So most studio budgets for films are between 60 and $90 million. Really, really expensive movies can be over $100 million, sometimes up to $200 million. And of those 12 films directed by women, only two of them had budgets over $100 million and they were both co-directed by men. Then of those remaining 10, the ones that were directed just by women, um, the average budget was $25.4 million, so well under half of what the average would normally be. And then for women of color, those four films, the average budget was $18 million. But you know, it's clear that women, and especially women of color, are being trusted with less financially than their male counterparts. But what is also interesting to note is that the domestic box office returns on those 10 films directed just by women was almost 200%. And for the films directed by women of color, it was over 230%. So I would say that betting on diverse directors is not that crazy. Um, all this said, it is important to recognize that there are allies in the industry and the industry is changing. Um, a lot of Dr. McTaggart's statistics indicated that there is a hopeful trajectory. Um, and so uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that there are those trying to disrupt the industry from without and within. Um, and change is really impossible without disruption from both. Um, and so, you know, there are studios, almost every studio and network has a diversity program now. Warner Media has committed to hiring at least 41% people of color. CBS has partnered with the NAACP. There are a lot of celebrities like Ryan Reynolds and Michael B. Jordan who have their own diversity initiatives. And then all that taken into consideration though, um, I think it's important to take advantage of these opportunities, but also recognize their limits. Because a lot of these companies have limited resources in terms of humans, financing, time. So a lot of these programs end up being very short-lived or unsustainable. There's sometimes not enough follow-through. So you get issues where sometimes like the diversity slot higher, um, which is something that uh, was in the movie Late Night. Um, you know, often television shows have one person who's hired it to be in the room as the diversity slot. Um, and oftentimes uh, it's just over 50% of those diversity slots that are hired back for a second year. So um, it's important to recognize that these diversity programs do have their limits. So with all that in mind, uh, you know, don't let that be the only way in which you participate and contribute to a more diverse Hollywood. Because as the artists and allies today and in the future, there are a lot of different ways that you can make change. So it's important to know um, yourself that you're capable of impacting the industry. And so, um, we all know that we are supposed to be doing the work um, in learning and unlearning and accountability within these social movements. Um, but for artists and allies in the media specialty, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge our special role. Um, there is a certain privilege that comes with being in the industry. Um, and even for, for you as people who are able to study in a cultural center, or I guess dispersed around the world right now, but um, 
usually in a cultural center with like-minded individuals is privileged. And uh, when you break into the industry, you will be told over and over again that it is a privilege to be here. And they've been saying this for decades within the context of go get me some coffee. There are a thousand other people who are ready to take your job. You're just lucky to be here. And I don't know that the first part is necessarily true, um, but the second part is you are lucky to be a storyteller and with that comes a lot of reach and a lot of ability to influence others. And so um, I want you to be able to recognize that you have power as a storyteller and as a filmmaker and as a studio executive or in any capacity in which you are in the entertainment industry. Um, and it's being conscientious of inclusivity every step of the way. So I'm going to give you four concrete steps to move forward with. Um, and the first is to collaborate. This one's easy. You're in a university setting where having conversations um, is in a relatively safe space. There's no place where you have discourse like on a college campus or I guess digitally now. Um, and so find people who are like-minded and synchronous with what you're thinking and create a community for yourselves and hold each other accountable. The second thing is to recognize when you're in a decision-making position and use that power to empower others. So as directors, producers, department heads, executives, you're going to be in a position to hire people. And at the beginning, it may be hiring one or two people. And eventually, maybe you're running a corporation of 500 individuals or a set that has 100 different people working under you. And you can be responsible for the cast and crew's diversity and inclusion. And once you're hiring those people, it's about continuing to nurture their skills. Um, and it's also about thinking about where your dollars are going. Once you get the budget from the people in power and you have budget yourself to use, whether it's a costuming budget or a makeup budget or concept art, whatever it is, use that budget wisely in terms of hiring vendors, loc choosing what locations you're using. Um, and then the next thing I would say is to use your voice. So in the entertainment industry, we are some of the very few people who are actually paid to have an opinion and a perspective. And our worldview is often shared with others. And it took me personally a long time to realize that this was an ability that I had. But once you do realize it, it's, it's imperative to use that voice to challenge tropes and create new archetypes because does it really matter if there are more Latinos on screen, if they're all maids? Um, and I would also say that as you're using your voice, uh, there is a creative and a financial argument to make films that's, that are diverse. Madeline mentioned actually um, a study from UCLA that came out yesterday um, that said that Films without authentic inclusive representation are estimated to lose 18 to 20% of their budgets in box office returns. And I think it's important to know things like that when you're arguing for why a certain perspective matters. Um, and then from a creative perspective, every day I hear pitches or read scripts where the prototype is Get Out or Parasite or Moonlight or Crazy Rich Asians. And that's because these films which are inherently diverse and authentically diverse are being recognized as huge feats of creative power. Um, and everybody is trying to replicate that. And so there's a lot of power behind uh, the creative and financial arguments there. And then lastly, um, I would say, tell stories that matter. You are literally creating worlds and characters and journeys. And so it's incumbent upon you to make them authentic and intersectional. Because at the end of the day, it all comes back to the power of storytelling and why you came into the industry to begin with. It's to connect with people and to relate to people. And it's about humanity. And we all have a responsibility as members of the industry to make sure that the on-screen world are better reflective of the world off screen. All right. Wow, thank you so much, Monica. 
And I think the most important thing is, you know, A, it's not only about educating yourself, but also being very, you know, authentic. Uh, so with that, um, we're going to ask all of our illustrious speakers to come back on. And, um, and Nina, I think you should come back on as well. And I want to welcome Lisa Amory, who leads our social media. And she is going to curate uh, some of our questions. So um, Lisa, uh, why don't you just shout out and uh, we'll see um, who can answer. Totally, yeah. Um, let's start with a pretty general question. Um, someone just wants to know if these PowerPoints will be available, um, where they can find them, and how they can get access. So what we're going to do is our uh, esteemed speakers are going to put together like a resource sheet um, that will have um, further reading materials, and they may have some links and things. Um, so we're going to put something together, and then we'll send it over to Nina, and then she can send it back to you. Um, in terms of, of the data um, that Dr. Um, Taggart um, showed you in terms of the research that she's done in partnership with us, um, that research is available you know, on our website. And I think as a follow-up, Nina, we can always send uh, links to some of our studies right. the, um, for them to take a look at. Thank you. That would be very much appreciated. Perfect. Cool, so everyone will have access. Um, next, uh, what advice would you give for an Asian American woman interested in screenwriting and working in film development in big film companies? How can women of color look into decision-making roles in the industry to, to diversify uh, the media narrative? I think that's two questions, but yeah, open to the floor. So Monica, why don't you, um, because you are a film executive and you are looking at talent, um, why don't you give that a, 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 an answer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's important to really lean into uh, what you believe in and uh, and what makes you unique as an individual. Um, I think that having a perspective as an Asian American woman um, and not being afraid to speak about it is uh, really powerful. Um, and I would say that uh, starting now, it's really important to find allies. Um, as students, you have this amazing superpower to be able to reach out to pretty much anyone in the industry and the odds of them responding are pretty high because nobody likes talking about themselves more than film executives. Um, <laughs> and so, um, cast a wide net. Um, and once you start meeting with people at the end of every conversation, ask them who else they should think you should talk to and, um, and go from there. Because for me, the way that I got into the industry was having a lot of these conversations and every single job I've gotten uh, has pretty much come from networking more so than anything else. And I would just say, um, you know, my other hat, is the uh, chair of the board of directors for the Television Academy Foundation. And uh, they have one of the best and most robust internship programs. And I'm sure Nina um, has had students come through, but um, it's a pathway to jobs. So if you haven't applied to any of the internships that the T Television Academy Foundation has, um, you definitely should. We also have the College Television Awards, which is the equivalent of a college Emmy. So I think, you know, you definitely want to look into that. And then also internships. I mean, I got my start. Uh, I started ABC back when ugh, none of you were born. And, um, you know, it was internships that really led the pathway. So I think that's definitely another, you know, another way in. Awesome. Um, in the same, um, the same realm, uh, this person says, thanks so much for being here. I'm an NYU Stern MBA hoping to work in content strategy. Conversations around allyship and representation tend to be among a fairly self-selecting group. Is there any way you recommend how allies can better reach out to those who need to hear this information more than others? Dr. McTaggart, you want to jump in? Yeah, I can start with this one. Um, you know, uh, my background is a sociologist, so I think um, 
as far as um, educating yourself about social injustice, I think, I know we are, you know, in media, but I think it goes beyond that. So, you know, just educating yourself on issues of race, gender, ability, any uh, identity um, is really helpful because you have to start there and then kind of jump off of that and, and focus how it affects, um, you know, media. Um, that would be my advice. I'm going to jump in because we did a NYU Q&A with uh, Franklin Leonard, the founder of The Blacklist earlier this year. And one of the things that we talked about in that conversation is about not being afraid to have the difficult conversations and also picking the time and place to have them. Um, you know, so like sizing up who you need to talk to, figuring out what's the best way, you know, sometimes like a public calling out, for example, may not be the way to deal with someone with a big ego, but if you approach them quietly, you might get in, but just sort of assessing who needs to be talked to about what, and then figuring the best way to present that information um, was something that we talked about that seemed very helpful. And I would also add, so I used to work in business development at a handful of the studios, um, the green light process and things like that. I have kind of a similar background to Mary Kate who asked this question. Um, and I think it's about knowing your audience and what will connect with them. Um, so for instance, if you are speaking with the finance people at the company or the strategy folks at the company, it's about dollars. It's all about cutting overhead costs and increasing profits. Um, so if you can figure out a way to make a financial argument, and we already gave you some statistics on that uh, during the course of this presentation, um, then do that. If it's a creative that you're speaking with, make the creative arguments. Um, it's really just knowing your audience, I think, and all the all of what Nina and Nanashka said as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, moving on, Hermione wants to just say thank you for presenting this information, uh, informative panel on media representation and social justice. What do you attribute to the lack of inclusivity of senior citizens in the storylines in the media? So can we come up with another term? You're all smart. Why don't we have a contest? How do we retire the words senior citizen, first of all? Because that is like a stereotype in itself. And uh, one of the things that um, uh, Dr. Nicole and Dr. McTaggart have been working on with Dr. Carolyn Heldman, who leads all of our research at the Institute, is adding age uh, 50 plus as a dimension to all of our research. We've always been, um, we've always looked at gender, race, LGBTQ plus disabilities, but we've added um, age and also body type as a core um, intersectional lens to all of our research. And, you know, you're right. What we have found is that um, characters fall off the cliff after the age of 40, and particularly for female characters, uh, they fall off the cliff after, you know, their 30s. And so there's a huge um, disparity, first of all. Um, secondly, they are the brunt of the joke. Um, they're not fit. They don't have a love life, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, but it's really something that, uh, aside from say AARP, which does amazing work, no one's really focused on it. So we are now bringing that to the forefront because when you think about it, women who are 50 plus are the healthiest and the wealthiest in the world. They control 85% of all you know, purchases and, and we're all living longer, thank goodness. So we have to really think about, about that. Um, and, and that is something that you'll see more and more for us. And if you look at our recent studies that have come out in the past two years, you'll see that age is a focus. And then I'll just throw it at Minica or, you know, um, Dr. McTaggart for anything else they want to chime in. Well, one thing I'd add is that we all have intersectional identities, but God willing, one thing we'll all be is old. So <laughs> we really need to change how we represent what the life experience is, because that is one place where all of our uh, identities will collide eventually. I was just going to quickly say that, you know, from the research we've done at the Institute on age, um, I feel like 
you know, we're really trying to delve into those intersectionalities and also finding out um, more about how older generations, as I would refer to it as, uh, and what kind of roles they're playing. And I think, you know, generally it's been a trend for Hollywood to kind of, you know, have this obsession with youth and maybe that's where it comes from that, um, you know, we don't really, we see aging as a negative versus a positive. Um, and I think that's where this stereotype has probably started. Um, so in that way, it's very unrealistic and hopefully we can, you know, do more research on this issue and find out how we can make more uh, inclusive roles for older generations. <clears throat> to piggyback off of what Dr. McTaggart said, um, I, there is definitely an obsession with youth, but I would also say that a lot of the films that are being greenlit right now and that are especially getting these huge multi-million dollar budgets are ones that are action films or, um, and inherently I think there's a belief um, in the industry that you have to be young to be an action star and that's certainly not the case. Um, but I think that uh, it's a, I'd be curious to see what some of that data is in terms of what genres. Uh, this is me just asking a question, really, <laughs> um, uh, an additional question. Um, but I'd be curious to see what genres um, uh, older individuals are working in and if they um, are able to extend into some of those bigger budget projects because there certainly is an audience and I think there's a financial argument behind making more movies for that audience. Awesome, yeah, really important subject. Thanks for uh, touching on that one. Uh, this one comes from Harris. I'm curious to what extent you conduct audiences research either quantitative or qualitative and if you have any insights into how audiences respond to representation or lack thereof. Or put another way, how do audiences articulate why representation matters to them? So there's a few things that I can address and then I'll throw it um, to everyone else. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, I don't know, a week ago, two weeks ago, everything's a blur. Uh, we just released a new study in partnership with Movio, which is uh, one of the world leading marketing, uh, theatrical marketing analytics companies. And what we were able to uh, look at is box office and ticket sales and the audiences that are buying those tickets and showing up for those movies. And clearly it showed a direct correlation in terms of who's on screen and who's in the audience. And that's what I meant when I said that there's a business imperative, it's not just a social imperative and doing good is good for business. Um, and then, you know, clearly our friends at UCLA um, also demonstrated that um, through their analytics, which they just released today you know, or, or yesterday. Um, and then in terms of, there's the impact piece, right? So uh, a few years ago, we conducted a study with J. Walter Thompson. And essentially we said to 9,000 women around the world, what's the positive impact uh, when you see um, a non-stereotypical or you see a role model in television or film? And 58% of them said, well, it led me to be more ambitious. 16% said, well, I wanted to take up a sport and Jean is a classic example, you know, of someone, um, a grown up who decided to uh, pursue archery and try out for the Olympics. 11% um, uh, said I wanted to uh, further my ambition. And I think one of the most poignant data points was 12% said that they left an abusive relationship because something they saw in the make-believe world. And that number went up to 25% uh, in terms of women from Saudi Arabia. So it's not just make believe, there is um, a dramatic impact. And so we do do get into that. We also don't have time for that today, but we have a massive survey on uh, girls in STEM, what keeps girls in STEM, what keeps them out of STEM. Um, so we do have a lot of uh, more consumer point of view. Uh, um, qualitative uh, baked into a lot of our research studies online. Awesome, thanks for sending in all your questions. I think we're actually at wrap, um, but yeah, thanks again for joining us and sending in your questions for us. 
So Jasmine, I'm going to bring back uh, Jasmine Barad, who's our director of events, who uh, may have some parting details for everybody. Yeah, um, again, thank you so much for having us today. Um, we'll be following up with some additional resources, like we talked about at the opening of the event, um, things you can read. We'll get some decks together that you can look at. And then any of the questions that were posed in the Q&A that we couldn't answer now, we will get back to you with some answers if we can. Um, as long as it wasn't anonymous, we have your name and we should be able to follow up directly um, with some answers. So thank you so much. This has been amazing. Nina, anything else you wanted to say before we jump off? No, I, I think this was just great. I, I want to thank everybody again, both the presenters and the participators. I, I know I learned some things and, uh, you know, I like to think this is one of my areas. So uh, thank you again to the experts and uh, to everyone for their participation. I think this was really wonderful and um, we hope to see you again soon. And I want to give a shout out to Sharon uh, Pierre-Louis. Thank you so much, our ASL interpreter. And uh, stay safe, everybody. Stay healthy. Good night.